as you that that's something really good because i was a bit afraid if i could do that or not so i actually wrote a uh, small comment for people to see later but then it's nice that i am also audible so i you know within a couple of minutes maybe i'll start off the entire thing and then you can take over from me right yeah yeah so let us skype be on so i know you are talking because i won't be able to hear it yeah yeah, yeah. let us be on and uh, i can see about uh, 16 17 people live and then i think in another couple of minutes that's going to go up yeah so yeah we can start so we'll just wait for a, a couple of minutes and then we'll start yeah yeah sure sure that works for me yeah ha huh, sridhar i think we should go ahead right uh, right okay cool uh, so uh, at the onset i would like to uh, you know uh, thank sridhar for taking out his uh, time uh, from uh, his uh, busy schedule to you know uh, be with us and you know share his uh, stories of how he spent a lot of time in bhagwan mahavir uh, wildlife sanctuary and national park uh, you know studying butterflies and uh, odonates there and uh, you know a bit of a background uh, sridhar you know is a personal friend and you know has been one of the best uh, students that i have known as a college student and uh, he spent a lot of time uh, you know trying to study ecology and trying to understand uh, basic ecology which has its roots in uh, you know biodiversity and a lot of uh, roots in trying to understand natural history and with that background i think uh, Uh, Sridhar has a good hold on ecology, and he is right now a PhD student in Cambridge. He is trying to uh, uh, study butterflies there as well. Uh, about which uh, Sridhar will uh, talk to all of us. And without mu- uh, wasting much time, I'll ask uh, Sridhar to start his uh, talk today. And uh, a, a request to all of you: whoever has questions, please start commenting on the. a uh, comment box and i will uh, pass on the questions to sridhar and he will uh, you know uh, personally answer all the questions that you have uh, for him and we'll close with uh, closing remarks uh, edition camp uh, Organized by Mineral Foundation of Goa, where I met Parag and a lot of other other naturalists who were actually working in the wildlife. And this is back uh, during my undergrad days uh, when I actually started uh, working on butterflies and dragonflies, like more seriously towards understanding ecology a bit. 
and uh, this is my friend Vignesh uh, <coughs> and myself uh, in 2014 uh, serving dragonflies uh, in Kuwait which is like a very nearby stream uh, nearby the railway station uh, and I'm actually quite glad that we did some bit of photo shooting there so I can actually show those pictures to you right now and 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 last time Pranoy showed like really quite a lot of habitat what what this uh, wildlife sanctuary actually hosts and and this remained my personal favorite the riparian forest which hosts like really uh, beautiful uh, a lot of endemic and a lot of lot of elusive species of uh, dragonflies and damselflies in general uh, and this was again in 2014 where uh, i was working on a project where uh, quantifying the diversity or in general community structure of butterflies uh, where i used to use the railroad as a transect and used to count uh, all the butterflies around so this is again doing uh, field work uh, in bhagwan mahavir wildlife century and i'm actually happy that uh, this uh, doing this explorations like so uh, I, I so this this was also like sort of a start towards my scientific career in general. So we found this uh, while doing the surveys again uh, on the railway track uh, in the nearby. There was a very small temporary stream uh, where we found this uh, dragonfly, uh, and after and and then after uh, looking at the IDs which were all helped with, uh, we actually uh, we, this was actually the first record of this of this dragonfly towards the northern western Ghats. But earlier this was only known from Kerala. And uh, this was back then was my first scientific publication, a very small note which got published in uh, Journal of Threat in Texas, which, which is just like three pages, like a short uh, natural history note. But this was like uh, an introduction towards uh, the scientific um, uh, world uh, in general. Uh, and also the butterfly work, what we did, like Dheeraj and I did quite a lot of uh, extensive surveys here. Uh, and Dheeraj presented this work uh, at SCC, it's a student conference for conservation science, which is one of the very important uh, conservation uh, uh, conference which happens uh, in Bangalore mostly. And Dheeraj presented this work over there, and that was again a sort of a, a very nice uh, uh, introduction towards the how the scientific world in general works. So, uh, so overall, overall this this uh, explorations and this you know small studies and publishing these small small things. Uh, uh, were, were really important uh, uh, for me to start my scientific career in general. And uh, as I said again, like Pronoi last time showed in detail about the different types of habitat, what we find in this uh, national, uh, in, the, in this wildlife sanctuary in general, that are like uh, evergreen, semi-evergreen, deciduous, semi-deciduous, and all sort of forests, and um, they host like really uh, immense amount of diversity of all invertebrates and vertebrates. And my personal favorites are these riparian habitats, what I said uh, said earlier. The riparian habitats are, are basically the sort of habitats where the water body, generally like the streams or the rivers, are surrounded by a um, uh, forest. And such habitats or these habitats are, are, are one of the best places if you want to see a uh, very uh, forest species or very endemic species. Uh, so, so and, and these are these habitats are plenty uh, um, in, in this wildlife century, which, which hosts uh, um, really supports a very good diversity, um, right? And I'll, I'll just I'll just scroll through uh, some of the very uh, some of the uh, very special species I guess what we find find in this sanctuary. And what I'm going to show most of them are uh, endemic species that we found. This is Malabar banded peacock. Uh, this is such a brilliant species. So this is the ventral side, but the upper side is even even more beautiful. You've got this really nice bluish shiny bands uh, uh, on the wings. Uh, it's, it's just beautiful. I think you just need to see this in the wild. Uh, this is another species, uh, Malabar raven, which is again endemic to the Western Ghats. Um, again, associated with the riparian habitats mostly. This is Tamil yeoman. Uh, this, this is a very, very common, uh, uh, this, this mostly common in forested areas. Again, associated closely with the riparian habitat. Uh, <laughs> now, this is Malabar tree nymph. Uh, I don't think photo does justice to this uh, species. Uh, you just need to see this species in the wild. It has got this really beautiful sailing flight. And, and you can see a lot of those individuals are flying across the stream that's high in the canopy. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating to watch them. Um, now this is another beautiful species, uh, the Glera bush brown. And, uh, and I think the only remarkable species about this is that it has got this very conspicuous structure, uh, which looks like an eye. This looks like a white pupil, a black circle around it, and it's a big eyeball. Uh, I talk more about the significance of uh, these color patterns like that, but I just wanted to show uh, the the diversity uh, of this uh, species of century actually host. Now, why I'm showing this damselfly picture here? So when I started my master's uh, in wildlife biology at AVC College, uh, I had to do uh, 
um, um, finally a master's project for around duration of five months. And I, I was I was thinking hard to what projects I wanted to work on. And by that time, I was actually interested quite a bit about evolutionary biology, but uh, I, I hadn't really done extensive reading uh, much. Uh, and initially, during my end of the first year, I was thinking that I would work on uh, this species of the damselfly, river heliodor. Uh, this is a very common species. You'll find it uh, on on rivers associated with you know gra grass reeds or you in in, in ponds or in any stagnant water bodies. Uh, males have got this uh, really uh, ornamented body. Uh, they've got, got these wings which has these black tips. Uh, half of the abdomen is uh, orange is yellow, rest of it is black. And and I don't know if some of you observed this, this species has got a really beautiful courtship display uh, where it just comes in front of the female, hovers in front of the female and then uh, and then there's is, there is a lot of things I could have tested along with this. Like I, I was thinking to do some experiments and try to find out what traits does female uh, uh, looks while choosing the males and those sort of things. Uh, but then I also wanted to work with someone who could tell me more about evolutionary biology in general. I know while looking through the profiles of some of the scientists uh, in India, I came across his profile of uh, Dr. Lhasa at uh, I.C. Trivandrum, who was working on, on butterflies and he was specifically working on satyrin butterflies, which, are, which, is, which is basically bush browns and the evening browns. <laughs> And and, uh, and and that it really attracted me because immediately when I thought of satyrins, the, the main question that came into my uh, head was, uh, you know, we, uh, th this, this butterfly, so what I'm showing here is a common evening brown. Uh, they, they've got this very conspicuous looking wet season morph and, and there is like another very cryptic dull looking dry season morph, right? So, so the main question that came into mind was like, uh, why some butterflies change colors? This is not the only species. You, you might have seen like most of the bush browns also change their colors in the wet season and the dry season morph. Uh, here I would also like to mention is that my, my talk will actually comprise uh, next part. I talk about some of this very common phenomena what we observe, like why some species look very similar or why species mud puddle. Uh, and I will try to give some of the reasoning behind this, uh, which also is very interesting in terms of, it shows like what sort of diversity these uh, butterflies or these insects in general have. Uh, and a later part of the talk, we'll try to stitch it together how these behaviors might be important uh, in conservation uh, and such. Right, <coughs> coming back to the bush brown story here. Right, so the, so the main question which interested is like why why some of these butterflies actually uh, change their colors and according to the seasons. Turns out answer was already there. Uh, and when I started looking through the literature, I found that uh, so this bush browns are actually widespread. And this species is actually from Africa, which is found in Malawi. This is called as a squinting bush brown. The name is very similar. And they even look very similar to our bush browns in general. And they have also got this very conspicuous looking bat season morph. And they have also got this dry season morph. So it, it was really fascinating. Uh, but then they already had this answer back in 1980s, 1990s, where they knew why these butterflies uh, actually changed their colors. Uh, and if some of you have not wondered why this happens, here is the answer for that. Like, so I showed right, this uh, wet season morph, they have this conspicuous looking rings, which are actually called as eye spots because they actually look like eyes. And they function as uh, anti-predatory strategies. Basically what it means that <laughs> these eye spots can actually fool the predators uh, like birds. For example, assume that if the bird is coming to attack this butterfly, right? Now, the attack on the thorax and the abdomen is lethal for a butterfly and won't be able to survive. Instead, this conspicuous looking uh, eye spots, they will, uh, they, they will, they will deflect the uh, bird's uh, attacks towards the hind wing instead of this. So they, they kind of act as a, um, act, act in deflection, like sort of attract their attention towards the wing parts rather than on the thorax part. Uh, and then you can imagine that if the attack is on the wings, then that is much, much less harmful compared to the attack on the head or the thorax, which is, which is really little. So, they, they, so this, this is what he called uh, as the adaptive significance uh, of this color pattern uh, in the wet season morph in this butterfly. <laughs> While in the dry season morph, I guess uh, it's, it's pretty obvious why they might be having cryptic colors, right? Now this is a photograph what I took in the dry season in Goa. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and then there's actually a butterfly perching here. So I would give a few seconds for some of you to just look at this image for a bit and let me see if, uh, if, if you can actually come up uh, or you can look at where the butterfly is actually perching here. <laughs> right. If some of you have managed, then good. If if some of you have not managed, then let me show you 
butterfly is sitting right here, right? You can see here, and this is like the zoomed in image of this butterfly. There's a dryism of, of a melanitis leda, so I don't think I need to explain much like what triptych functions are actually working here, right? And this sort of makes sense because if you might have seen in the dry season where most of the trees shed their leaves and on the forest floor, all of it would be covered with the leaves. Uh, and then when this butterfly's special dry season morphs, when they sit on the floor, it's just impossible. It's so difficult to actually locate them. And that, that makes predators to actually very difficult to locate them as well. And you can only see them when they are uh, flying across. Uh, and some might also wonder is like, how are they actually able to predict the seasonal change, right? I mean, we use make use a meteorological department to tell us when the seasons are going to change, when the seasons are not going to change. But how do these butterflies can actually predict how they know like when the wet season is going to transition to dry season uh, uh, and the cycle continues. So, and again, like there is an experimental evidence uh, showing that the larvae can actually interpret um, the differences uh, in the temperature, humidity, or the host plant quality, uh, what goes in, in the environment. So the larvae have the sensitive, uh, the sensory mechanisms by which they can interpret these differences. And that helps them to actually predict what is the immediate, what the future uh, environment is going to be. And accordingly, they will decide whether they want to form the wet season form, whether they want to form the dry season form. Uh, this is a very, very uh, simplistic explanation I'm giving you, but but there is like a really interesting mechanism which which underlies uh, what causes this. And if anyone is interested, then I'll be very happy to talk about this later. Uh, another common thing we might have observed is, uh, especially in blues, they're like very small, we call them lysinates. Uh, so you might have seen uh, in many of these blues, they have these tails uh, at the, at the, on, on the wings, especially on the hind wings like here. And they have got this like dots and this, um, this uh, very filament like structure. <laughs> and if you have seen them in the field, when they actually perch on the ground, they would be moving their wings like up and down, up and down in a very particular motion. And that sort of gives you a sense that um, this eyes are, are this, the spots actually sort of look like eyes and they look like antennas. I'm not making up the stories, uh, but there is actually a strong uh, evidence, experimental evidence uh, in the lab where they where you keep the butterfly and if you keep predator, instead of attacking on the head again, as I told you before, instead they will go and attack uh, on these hind parts. And these are called as false head and the hypothesis in general is called as a high, uh, false head hypothesis. Uh, so it's, it's really fascinating to see them because, because before reading all of these things, I actually saw all of this, uh, these behaviors and all of these patterns in the field, but never asked this why question uh, and, and asking that and then trying to know why some things exist is, is, is really illuminating, I feel. So I hope uh, many of you will also start asking these questions. Uh, another common phenomena is about mimicry. This is a very famous uh, 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 phenomena and many of you might have heard about it. Right, there are two butterflies here. One is a plain tiger, and this is the female of the Danaidae fly, uh, butterfly. And they look very similar for the train for the untrained eyes. They would look actually very similar, very difficult to identify in the field if you're not used to looking at them. Uh, so the question is, why these two different species look so similar? Right, why they have like such a what you call as a very convergent uh, sort of the you know, of the wing pattern? Now, if you if you, if you look uh, and then and then. What uh, that the plain tigers are actually toxic. Uh, it's like the, the tigers in general are called as milkweed butterflies because they feed on this plant uh, which produce glucosides, uh, they produce latex and it has a lot of glucosides. And larvae feed on these plants, they sequester or they keep the these toxins in their body. Uh, and uh, if predators want to eat this, then they can't because these are really toxic to eat, so predators don't use won't be able to uh, consume them. And uh, this bright orange or reddish coloration, they act as a warning signal because uh, even their flight are uh, like slow sailing sort of flight uh, because it's sort of a warning coloration and it warns the predators that it should not actually come and attack or uh, try to eat this butterfly. Uh, and and what happens is the this female of the Danaidic fly, or there are many of females which, which show this sort of mimicry, it sort of makes use or takes advantage of the plain tiger and uh, having the very similar coloration, but 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 this is not toxic, right? So having the similar coloration, it sort of fools predator thinking that it is also plain tiger. Uh, this is something uh, called as the bait chain mimicry, uh, where the non-palatable species or non-toxic species will mimic the toxic species. Uh, and and, and the, just extending the bait chain mimicry to another type of the mimicry, uh, where there are, there are shown like three tiger species, like glassy dark blue and the tiger. 
and all of these are toxic right uh, <laughs> Right. So, so this is just this is, this is here when when multiple toxic species are mimicking each other. These are called as mimicry rings, and the idea is same here. For example, let's say if the bird comes and attacks glassy tiger, and it immediately knows it's toxic, right? And then it will associate this color pattern in general is toxic, and it will just won't go and uh, and attack these ones. So the probability of survival of other species by sampling just one species is really really high. Uh, and this is something called as the Mullerian mimicry, uh, and, and these are called mimic rings where multiple toxic species they mimic each other or have the very similar hovering patterns. Even the the, uh, uh, the Malabar tree nymph I showed you before falls in this mimic ring because it has got a very similar color pattern uh, as uh, this tigers. So, um, right. The next I wanted to talk about mud puddling. <laughs> This is another very common uh, thing everyone observes. So if you go on the river bed, uh, or if there is a dead animal or the dead crabs which you often find at the river shows, you will see like lots of butterflies are coming uh, and sitting on them. There's a, like various blue bottles which you see commonly mud puddling on the string bed. Also, in the, uh, this is the, another beautiful image of the angry piero, why it's happening. Uh, and also you might have noticed that when you sweat a lot uh, and when you really get stinky, like a lot of but like especially rajas and nawabs will like start getting attracted to you uh, and and i guess that's a very uh, nice way like if you want to get selfie i guess uh, just get a sweaty instinct and you'll be able to get a nice selfie with butterflies um right so why do actually butterflies hum mud puddle uh, the general explanation given sometimes is it just used for mating but it's not clear explanation is given why exactly that happens so there is again experimental evidence which has shown that uh, these butterflies actually look for sodium and amino acids. They, they specifically take sodium and amino acids from the from the uh, from the soil where they are uh, where they are mud puddling or when they sit on the carcass, uh, which presumably has a lot of amino acids. So they take that. But why do they need amino acids and sodium? It has to do something to do with the breeding biology of butterflies. So, so in, in in butterflies, males transfer something called as a spermatophores to the females. So, spermatophore is basically a package of sperms along with a lot of nutrients, which is mainly comprised of proteins uh, and also like high content of sodium in them. Uh, and males deliver this spermatophore to the females uh, during mating. Now, the spermatophore uh, is a very important component of the breeding biology in general. And, and you'd be surprised to know that in some butterflies, they, males can transfer 23% of their body weight of the spermatophore. Assume if the human being is say 50 kg, the 23% of that is around 13, 12 to 13 kg. So you can assume like what significant proportion uh, it forms for the body size. And why spermatophores are important is that uh, it, it enhances females egg production because eggs contain a lot of protein. So this is sort of a donation from the males uh, to the females uh, to enhance its egg production. Now the role of sodium is not really clear why they use it uh, and also I haven't read much enough of this thing so uh, I, I can't comment more on the role of sodium but the role of amino acids or protein in general is, is very very known so it has to do something with the uh, breeding biology and when males give the spermatophores which are also uh, called as a nuptial gift or the way to impress the females. Um, right. <laughs> now the next part of my talk from here on uh, I will talk a bit on the conservation uh, biology, the conservation uh, aspect of it. Now uh, we're very well aware, like say the the like an, uh, thing, the railway lines or uh, or building roads has uh, has like a very direct consequences. Like it it, it does for it fragments the forest um, with a lot of vehicles on the road and which causes rot rot of road killing, which we are very clear of. For example, you can see here. I'm sorry to show these gruesome pictures, but I think it's very important here. Uh, so all, all of the all of this um, uh, so this this road kills um, and how the fragmentation causes like lots of these kills of say mammals and amphibians and insects is directly evident to our eyes right so we can just we can say that the vehicles are so many that that they are killing a lot of the wildlife and we can see the direct effect but what about the effect which we can't see with our naked eyes or which are very subtle effects right but then those things Let's say from 10 years down the lane, you might observe something is happening, some butterfly population is crashing, but there is no way of knowing why that might be happening. And to do that, we need to have very good understanding uh, on the natural history of the species, right? So what the butterflies feed on, what the larvae feed on, what sort of host plant it uses, what other species it is dependent on, 
like say other butterflies or other ants uh, so it's very important to know all of this multi-dimensional uh, uh, aspects of the species uh, so one 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 example here is uh, we know like a lot of species actually uh, are getting attracted to this invasive lantana chimera plant so if, if they are there you might see like so many butterflies just coming and uh, feeding uh, on the nectar uh, and 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 and, and it's so bad that uh, I think when I was doing my undergrad, like some of the teachers were actually uh, advising everyone to plant lentina in their gardens because uh, the, because because of because the visual thing is very appealing, right? Like you just see a lot of them coming um, and uh, feeding. Uh, but but what but has anyone realized that this might be having a really strong effect? On actual uh, um, uh, natural uh, nectar plants, like for example, say before invasion of the cam uh, uh, the lantanas. I mean, of course, there have been hundreds of years there, uh, but but because the lantanas might be attracting so many species, the native plants uh, on which uh, native plants which depend on the pollination uh, uh, depend on butterflies for the pollination. So they might be getting affected in some way, but then we have no data. We we have we have nothing to quantify that this might be happening or this might be not happening, right? So we need such sort of a very quantitative data to say this is happening and this is how it is affecting the uh, the the natural host plants or the natural nectar plants. Uh, so such sort of uh, studies are really needed to actually understand how sensitive these interactions are. <laughs> Another uh, example, again, like let, let's take the hypothetical example uh, of mimicry here, right? As I told before, like this is the toxic species and uh, this is non-toxic species, but it mimics this to take the advantage of. Uh, of this butterfly. Now imagine a scenario where where we pause the deforestation and then we have just completely wiped out host plant of this species, right? <laughs> this means that the plain tiger uh, abundance will come down, like drastically come down. And what will happen is the dinner egg fly number will suddenly become uh, abundant in the population. And let's say if some birds like by mistake uh, go and, and feed on the dinner egg fly, and then they will realize that, they, that the birds will have been fooled all this while because these are not at all toxic. And then that will, and then imagine that that will just increase the predation rate so much. This can actually drive the population to extinction. Like it's called as a local extinctions might happen. This is the hypothetical example I'm giving you, but it might indeed be true, right? In some way, and there are some exper there are some long term studies which show like such subtle interaction can actually take place. But then they are slow. They might take like 10, 15 years uh, uh, to happen. But we do need to know them to predict what's going to ha happen in the long term. Now. Before ending the presentation, uh, I want to give this one example. This is not an Indian example. Uh, th th this was a really remarkable study which was conducted in UK and uh, is considered as an iconic example in uh, conservation. Uh, but then I want to give this example just to just to uh, show that how how important it is to um, you know uh, know these really uh, interactions and and how how that can actually help in conservation, right? So these are called large blue butterflies. Uh, these are belonging to the family Lysinidae. What I'm showing here is the genus Fingaris, uh, <coughs> Arion, which is found in UK and uh, in the Europe. But the genus is also represented in Southeast Asia. And I think one species, if I'm not wrong, is also uh, found in Northeast India. Uh, but these species have got really fascinating and which I also call as a very bizarre uh, sort of a, a natural history. So let me just walk you through that, right? So the butterfly will lay her egg on the plant, which is called the wild thyme, which is found uh, in generally in the grasslands. Now what happens is the larvae will hatch, egg egg will hatch, and the larvae will uh, feed on the plant uh, until they are third in star. But after third in star, larvae will drop on the ground, where they are picked by this ants called as the myrmica ants. Now, so how does the larvae does that? Is larvae secrets a uh, chemicals in the cuticle uh, are also called as hydrocarbons uh, which it will mimic uh, to the ant larvae and it will fool this ants to think that it's a larvae uh, of their species so this ants will pick up this larvae and take to the ant nest now once inside the ant nest the larvae will start mimicking the queen by producing again these chemicals are called hydrocarbons and, and, and in some species, the, the larvae even even mimics, uh, or even produces the sounds similar to the queens uh, uh, of the uh, which are present in the ant nest. Uh, and then once inside, once it starts mimicking the queen, then what it does is it, it will start food, uh, uh, feeding on the ant larvae or the ant broods. Or in some species, uh, this the butterfly larvae will be actually fed by ants because 
they think that uh, uh, it, it's the queen. So it, it just like this is sort of a parasitism where it takes advantage uh, by fooling the ants thinking that it's the queen. So it's, it's a really fascinating uh, natural history here. But this, this fascinating thing was also responsible uh, for its extinction. And you can also see like how strong is the association between this butterfly uh, and the ants here, which is also the case in many of the many of the lice in the blues butterflies where they are uh, dependent on uh, on each other. Uh, that there's a, there's a sort of a um, uh, interaction goes on between uh, ants and uh, butterflies. So this is how the one of the larvae uh, of the Swingari species looks. Um, and this is this is the uh, the larvae uh, of another fungary species which is found uh, in the ant nest so so yes and you can see this ants around a uh, feeding larvae i guess uh, this is really uh, really fascinating um now now so what happened is uh, and so you can see this graph this is a very simple graph this basically shows like the number of uh, the butterfly colonies and this is the year. You can see that the number started declining from around 1964 onwards. There was a really, really sharp decline. And this butterfly went extinct in 1979 in UK. Right? It went extinct in 1979. And the bee says that there have been several reintroductions, uh, the same species which was also found in Sweden. So they reintroduced this species uh, back from the Sweden to uh, actually uh, um, to, to, to get this population uh, back uh, in UK. So then, what 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 actually drove the extinction uh, of this species, right? So that is that is an interesting story here. So what actually caused the extinction uh, of these butterflies is the ant which was responsible uh, uh, for the extinction of this butterfly. So what actually happened was, so when the butterfly population started declining towards 1960 onwards. So the conservationists thought that uh, they should stop all the grazing. They thought that maybe man-made activities or uh, the grazing is actually causing or disturbing this butterfly. So they erected fences across all the grasslands. This species is actually found most associated with the grasslands. So they erected fences everywhere, which means the grazing stopped. Uh, and also there was an event of myxomatosis, uh, that is the viral disease, uh, which mainly affects rabbits. Uh, and rabbits are one of the major herbivores um, in UK or, or in such type of habitats. So myxomatosis uh, wiped out the major population uh, of the rabbits. So the, what that led to the grass overgrowth, right? So because because the, the grazing stopped, grasses, uh, grasses, uh, grasses. The, the, there was overgrowth in the grasses, and because there was overgrowth in the grasses, and which sort of shielded the sunshine, that started lowering the soil temperature. And this lowering of the soil temperature affected ants because the ant, the, the Myrmica subulati which, on which this butterfly depends, it likes a slightly hotter uh, hotter soil uh, because it, it needs that temperature is critical for the development of the broods. And, and because the soil temperature started going down because of the overgrowth in the grass, other species uh, which, which which persisted in this uh, uh, the lower temperature soil conditions, they started outcompeting uh, uh, Myrmica's ability. So, and that sort of drove uh, the Myrmica populations uh, to extinction here in this local grasslands. And since that drove, uh, because that affected ants, it directly affected butterflies as well. Uh, so it, it was fascinating that they even came up with the number. They sh they showed that uh, even making a model, a very simple model, where they actually showed that the grass they had to maintain the grassland up to two centimeters in length uh, to be able to uh, keep this uh, species um, in those grassland. So now I think, and then once they started managing those grassland, they started cutting those grasslands and managing them, uh, and they, they were able to recover this uh, population. Uh, okay. So I, I think so. This this sh sort of uh, shows us that how interdependent these two species are, or how interdependent these butterflies in general are, uh, which is uh, which is very very important. So that's why that's why I I am sort of uh, emphasizing the fact that we need to know this multifaceted uh, 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 how how the species interact uh, with with many different or with the environment uh, around it. Sorry, my slides are stuck again. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted to show that once it started maintaining the grasses here, the population really went up and up and up. Uh, and now, or like in the recent times, the population is even more than it was in the original. So that's why this is actually considered as a conservation success story. 
uh, and I think we should really appreciate like the intricacies that are involved uh, 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 when someone designs the conservation approaches. And just a very general message I wanted to give here is uh, like whenever we do like a lot of the people are actually getting aware of the diversity around us like because of the social platforms. Uh, so documentation of biodiversity is really, really important, right? But so is, is sharing this knowledge across. For example, we have these biodiversity portals uh, which are keeping very up-to-date information on what we find creating really good distribution maps. So all of us might not be able to do very hardcore research, but even contribution in terms of this basic documentation is really, really important. And equally, it's important to publish these papers in the, in the, in the journals because this helps it to circulate around the wider community of the of the scientists and, and that is really really important uh, some of the younger scientists or some of the younger uh, people who are just doing their undergrads or even schools or who are planning to do uh, something in research uh, i would encourage them to ask this very important why question when they go out in the field when they do something or when they see an animal doing something i want them to ask like why they are doing something this is a very famous phrase uh, what we keep keep quoting in behavioral or evolutionary biology is why do animals do what they do so i think you start asking that i think and then then it will be like you know solving the piece of a puzzle every time you start asking but that will also require a lot of hard work reading literature conducting experiments and so on uh, and a very crucial part i guess is also public engagement we need to convey whatever we find all the diversity all the results we need to convey that to the local public uh, in a very efficient way uh, and it's sort of uh, uh, this is actually my first talk, I guess I'm giving uh, to a very general audience first time and then uh, I'm really enjoying this process but then that also made me realize that how important it is to talk in a very simple language and to actually uh, communicate uh, with a wider uh, group of people. Uh, and ending my presentation with right from where I started, uh, this forest actually taught me a lot uh, uh, right in terms of uh, uh, the wildlife and then, then all the uh, things I'm doing right now. Uh, so this this forests are really, really important and they host this really amazing diversity from invertebrates, vertebrates, plants and everything what you can think of. Uh, and this is the image uh, I think what I took uh, from the Dutsaga. Uh, so you can just see like how, how beautiful this forests are and uh, I think we should do uh, whatever possible in our capacity uh, to safeguard this forest as well. Uh, and with that, I would like to acknowledge few people, uh, Parag, Shraddha, Omkar, Rohan, who actually introduced me to wildlife uh, right uh, during the early age. Um, academically, Dr. Ulasa helped me to conduct my master's project, and which was a big, uh, big, uh, uh, important event, I guess, in my life. Uh, Freerk uh, uh, was my supervisor during my master's project. Uh, Oscar and Paul are my uh, supervisors uh, here in Cambridge. Uh, and, and friends and family, Dheeraj has been a big support in general, Viginesh. Uh, thanks for again inviting me, Harshada. Uh, we have been talking about wildlife for quite a while now, and Abhijit, uh, Adarsh, and many others which I haven't listed out here, uh, who in general helped to explore this forest uh, uh, a lot. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, yeah, Sridhar, uh, I hope you can listen to me, I right? Can, I can turn, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, thanks a lot uh, for this really amazing uh, hutke kind of a talk that we have had. Uh, for example, it was very important uh, that it, the message goes out to people about what kind of research happens in the forest. Like Parag did a session uh, like two days back, mm -hmm. then he spoke about what kind of diversity is there in Bhagwan Mahavir and you know, the he showcased all the biodiversity in those areas. But I think this was uh, really important to put in perspective that these forests are also, you know, uh, hotbeds and grounds for young uh, ambitious researchers who are based in Goa or, you know, who want to go out and, you know, explore uh, their opportunities and options. Uh, we have an entire living laboratory in our background. Exactly. And I think it was really important that you, uh, your talk really conveyed how important these living backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. so, so just, just if I can say, I mean, I, I find it so funny sometimes, you know, because in UK, we need to mention when I do my experiments, we get uh -huh. fishes from Africa and keep it on our labs. Uh, yeah. But I sometimes think if I was working in India, I could just place like two bait traps back in my garden and then I would get whatever I wanted. So uh, yeah. I really need to appreciate like what we have back there. Yes. Uh, so with that, Sridhar, I think there are a couple of, like there are two questions that have come up as of now. Yeah. And the first one is, uh, you know, from Rashmi. Rashmi asks you, what kind of toxins uh, do these butterflies have? 
and i think it was when you were talking about the danny deck fly uh, yeah, yeah 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 slide and then there is another means uh, there's a follow up and do dragonflies have toxins if so uh, what are uh, no sorry do they have any yeah okay, and okay. what about toxins in dragonfly do they have any yeah that's okay. the first question right uh, for the for the butterflies i think uh, in tigers if i remember in the striped tiger plain tigers uh, they feed on this latex driven plants right? like some you, you might know like they feed on this plants called is rui the striped tigers and plain tigers i guess uh, 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 it's called kelotropy gigantea i guess the species so they secrete this latex and and it doesn't show that something called the glycosides i exactly don't know what chemicals like exactly uh, they are, i think in general called as a glycosides uh, and when like say the birds feed them uh, i think they will they will increase their heart beat uh, uh, yeah it will increase the blood pressure and the heart beat and it also causes a like, regurgitation in some species so it really affects them in some ways uh, in some other butterflies for example uh, i'm giving the international example again here this butterfly is called as heliconius which are found in south america uh, they have the compound called as cyanogenic compounds uh, uh, and the larvae feed on something called a passion flower passion passion vines uh, and these cyanogens are really really toxic so uh, Yes, so these are the major class of compounds, but I don't really know exact chemical composition of what it is. You might find it like quite a lot of literature on that too. Uh, and regarding uh, if damsel flies are toxic, no, I don't think so. Any of the damsel flies are toxic. Uh, but I would like to mention one thing is that how again like how these species are dependent on each other. This is again a study from South America where they showed that. Uh, so in South America, you got these butterflies called clear wing butterflies, uh, and uh, there are some damsel flies. which actually make this clearing butterflies because the clearing butterflies are toxic so it's again you know like a uh, uh, baits in mimicry working here where damsel flies are actually mimicking butterflies uh, which is which is very uh, interesting uh, so yeah uh, see the there is one question from para yeah uh, I, i don't know if it's a question or a comment but i yeah. could maybe convert it into a question as well yeah. so para uh, says historically it was assumed that so- southern western ghat species are not found in goa okay most of the new records are in- interestingly south western ghat endemics so i guess uh, para wants you uh, to comment on this and i would probably add to this do you think there is a shift in the range of certain species from south western ghats because the climate of the climate connection what is your comment on that mm, to be honest i'm not really sure but i think remember pranay we were talking something called as a goa gap which was there uh, yes yes <laughs> and i don't know if someone has actually looked if that acts as a barrier in some way uh, but i think the answer to this might lie if we look a bit about geology in general i guess which i am mm. not really aware about Uh, I was thinking about some things like to look at what actually causes this sort of a range limits. Like yes, we we know that in Goa is sort of a confluence. Of Parag was saying before that you find a mix of north, but a major element of the southwestern Ghats. But no, sorry, I I I don't really know why exactly that might be happening. Yeah, uh, fair enough, sir. Uh, because that's a, a loaded question, and I don't I don't think that can happen over Facebook Live. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, you need to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, 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 a light, light question. Uh, yeah. Vice Chair, and he asks you, if you don't mind, can you share one of the best memories you had with butterflies in Bhagwan Mahavir Wildlife Sanctuary? With butterflies, I had in Bhagwan Mahavir Wildlife Sanctuary. Right. <laughs> okay. This this is not very exciting, but this is a very illuminating fact, I guess. Uh, I think I remember I was walking with Parag again because I had I had Parag has been a major uh, a driver of my what I'm thinking actually. So we were we were just walking on the railway track um, that time and then I think the common Mormon female uh, uh, actually flight past by so and 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 you might know I don't know if someone knows and the common Mormon female has this lot of mimetic groups uh, like the one morph of the female mimics common rose another morph of the female mimics crimson rose while one morph of the female actually looks like the looks like the a uh, male uh, and uh, an answer to that was recently known actually krishnamay kunte published a paper in nature actually which showed why that might be the case and what genes and kind of thing but that's the more details uh, but yeah but that was a very illuminating fact because para was like uh, you know there are so many of this this uh, have you ever thought about uh, uh, why there are different morphs like why these females are actually mimicking different different things uh, and and that just sort of hit me that time you know it's like i had never thought of that because i had observed these things happening but uh, but never observed like you know but never asked like why that might be the case 
uh, and I still remember that I guess and from there onwards I think I started looking things in a very different way well it's not like a, a very switch where happened but uh, but but uh, in a uh, very graduate time I guess uh, that, that was very illuminating I guess those those sort of questions which uh, but yeah big thanks to Parag again uh, Okay, yeah, uh, Sridhar, yeah, thanks a lot. I think uh, those were the few questions that came. Uh, uh, <laughs> right, great. So that were, those were a few questions that came across. And I think uh, more questions will come up as people, you know, uh, see the recording of this. Uh, you know, I'll be happy to tell you that about 70 people saw your talk live. Okay. And, you know, uh, based on the reach and the interest that people have on the subject, I think it, 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 there's going to be about uh, 1K to one and a half K views for your talk. So, you would ex, ex, you know, expect more questions yeah, uh, that right. come in the comment section. So, you know, I, I'll let you know as and when they come and then you can answer those uh, yeah, as and when they come. And it was really fascinating to listen to your talk, especially the nice connect that you made between you and me, that is butterflies and yeah, ants. Yeah, yeah. That was really interesting. Yeah. And it also shows how important insects are for designing conservation exactly. strategies yes. and uh, policy uh, making uh, strategies. Yes. So that's uh, really interesting. The the, of, uh, the talk. Yeah, I think that uh, brings us to the end of this uh, uh, talk today. And for everyone who is still tuned on uh, tuned into this, uh, next week we will probably have another uh, uh, upcoming, or uh, maybe not upcoming, as uh, Parag says. Uh, we'll have probably another uh, upcoming. Uh, uh, researcher from Goa who will speak about wasps. Uh, who will speak about wasps? Uh, that is Sandesh. Uh, he has spent a lot of time in Bhagwan Mahavir trying to understand uh, wasp uh, diversity and distribution. So it would be really interesting to listen to wasps after ants and butterflies, which it was on an evolutionary track. But then, yeah, depending on availability, it goes here and there. Right. So uh, thanks to everyone. Okay. Uh, Parag has another question uh, to you, Sridhar, I think, which is kind of interesting. Can you put light on andromorphs in butterflies? I, and I'm not sure. I have heard of andromorphs, but yeah. Is it andromorphs? It, it, it spells A-N-D-O-M-O-R-P-H-S. Uh, then, 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 then it's andromorphs. Uh, andromorph, yeah, yeah. Wait, can I think of any andromorphs? Yes, I mean, yeah, the common rose has andromorph, right? One female which looks like a male. Uh, yeah. As andromorph. Uh... Uh, is there any other species I'm thinking of? But then, yeah, I think the question is more on an evolutionary line. Why do you think? Yeah. What, what do andromorphs do there? Like we have the same in ants as well, gynandromorphs. Yes, you know, yes, you have yes. same in ants as well. You have half males and yes. half females. Then the question yes. would be, what's the evolutionary significance of that? And you, being an evolutionary biologist, could answer this better. Yes, uh, I'm trying to remember. Krishna Meghu wrote a really nice review on why these morphs exist. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't really have a good answer to that right now. I have a paper, I'll have to read that paper again and I'll have to come back with the answer. Yeah, yeah great. It happens yeah. all the time. Fair yeah. enough. No, uh, because... Once things are not online with what you do for a long time, I guess, it evaporates. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. Sort of, I But I think it's a good time for you to read up and then share that oh, yeah, yeah, on this. Definitely. I'll even share the paper if someone is interested in more scientific ways of looking into it. Sure, sure, yes. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Sridhar, and thanks to everyone who has, uh, you know, tuned in to us. And uh, we hope to continue this uh, and bringing more on lesser fauna. So next weekend will be uh, Sandesh, who will uh, talk about wasps, uh, hopefully. And then we will have Omkar, who will uh, talk about reptiles and amphibians, either in between the week or maybe uh, the Saturday of the next weekend. So yeah, uh, stay tuned with us and we hope to generate more awareness about uh, lesser uh, fauna from Bhagwan Mahavir. And hopefully all of these end up uh, giving teeth to the kind of questions that we are raising in the current scenario. Thanks a lot. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Sridhar. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye.